Well, we're going to continue our study this morning in the book of Revelation, chapter 14. We have begun our study on the three angels. We've looked at several facets already, but I just want to do a quick review in Revelation 14 as we started. These are not literal angels, are they? We found that these are messages given by messengers. And how much of the world do they go to? All the world. A most crucial message. It's really God's answer to Revelation 13 where you have all this deception. You have this, the beast with his agenda trying to deceive the world. And God has these three last messages. Sort of the antidote, if you will, for this great deception. We found that the timing of these messages, we're living right in that time. From 1798 culminating then with that last great conflict that this world will be in, these messages swell. We are living right there in that time. And as we've said before, and I'm going to repeat this theme every time as we're studying the three angels' messages, of so great importance are these messages. You are either preaching, teaching, sharing the three angels' messages, or you need them preached to you. That's how important, that's how vital these messages are for the very time that you and I live in. Just reviewing again, Revelation 14, 6, as we were introduced to these messages. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. What are those elements of the gospel? Well, we must know our condition before God. We must have a commitment, and in that commitment we found is the justification, the turning from sin, and the work of God in sanctification, the cleansing from all sin. And finally, the one that most of evangelical Christianity ignores and does not want to talk about, the fact that there is an investigative judgment as to whether you have seen your true condition, as to whether you are truly all in, that you're truly committed to God. And so there will be a judgment, an investigative judgment, and that is presented as part of the gospel message. We kind of find those elements, if you will, even in the first angel. Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Those elements are there right in the first angel's message. We looked last time at the first imperative. There's really three imperatives or three commands in the first angel's message. Fear God. Give glory to Him and worship. We're going to look at each one of those in depth. We've already looked at what it means to fear God. That fear was not a running from God, but it was a recognizing that He is God and you are not. We are not. We should have a reverential respect for Him as our Maker. We found also that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is teaching us to hate evil as we see who we are and who He is. It brings us to a place where there's a true conversion that happens in the heart. We said that this flew in the face of the agenda of the beast because what is the beast saying in Revelation chapter 13? What is happening in his agenda? Well, we found that all the world marveled and followed the beast. What does it mean to marvel? It means to stand in awe. There's a reverential fear if you will, in this deception. So all the world is marveling or fearing, coming to a reverential respect to the wrong individual, to the beast. It also said, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? To say that, to say who is like him, who can make war with him, is a reverential fear and respect. The first angel's message flies in the face of this deception. It says, rather than fear the beast, fear God and give glory to him. Today, we're going to look at what it means to give glory to God. What does it mean to give glory? Well, when we're talking about God, there's actually three facets of glory that you find in Scripture. One of the facets that you find is that God is indwelling in this unapproachable light. He's a consuming fire. In the Old Testament, it was known as the Shekinah that dwelt in the very most holy place of the sanctuary. Where He is, His very essence, is this glory beyond comprehension. You may remember the story when the Philistines uh, got a hold of the Ark of God in battle. And they set that Ark before their, their God named Dagon. 
Anybody remember this story in Samuel? And what did they find? The next day when they came in, what, what, what had happened to Dagon? He had fallen in a prostate position. His arms and everything fallen off. His head had fallen off before the ark. I'm reminded of Isaiah 42 and verse 8. I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory, the Shekinah, this very presence of this consuming fire, he says, I will not give to another nor my praise to carved images. This is not the glory that we are to give back to God because we cannot have it. It is His alone. We will never possess the Shekinah, the essence of that consuming fire. That's not the glory that's being mentioned in Revelation 14. The second facet of glory is to give praise to God. We find an example of that in the story we find in the Gospels of the ten lepers. And you remember as Jesus healed the ten lepers, that one returned to Him to give thanks, to give praise. Luke 17, verses 17 and 18. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? So here we see clearly, to praise Him, to thank Him, is to give glory to God. That clearly is presented in Revelation 14. To fear God and give glory to Him. As we found fear is that conversion experience to give glory is the thanks. The returning of, of just your worship to God. That is to give glory to God. But there is another aspect of glory. There's a third facet to the glory of God that I find most fascinating and very in-depth uh, as to our experience that we should have with our Maker. It's probably best represented in the story of Moses in Exodus, Exodus 33 and verse 18. You remember the experience. Moses has gone up on the mountain. He's conversing with God, and in that conversation, he says to God, please show me your glory. Now, God said, no one can see my face and live. Now, he's talking there about the essence of who he is, right? That all-consuming fire. But he does say to Moses that he will hide him in the cleft of the rock. And then he presents to Moses the glory in a way that you wouldn't necessarily, from the, from the foremost of thought, think about it this way. But his glory is presented to Moses in his character. We find in Exodus 33... 21 through 23. And the Lord said, Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. You know, I like the imagery here to Jesus in this, in this conversation. Who is the rock? Jesus is the rock. Moses is to stand upon the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft. He's going to put you in Christ. In Christ. And will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The following day, as you read the account, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. It was a declaration of the very character of God. What was His glory? It was a declaration of His character. You know, this is the very thing, this glory that I'm talking about, a reflection, if you will, of His character, man had from the beginning. You remember that in Genesis when, when God said, let us make man in our what? In our image, in our likeness. Man, humanity, in its original creation was a reflection of the glory, the character, if you will, of God. Now we know, unfortunately, that sin marred that. Sin removed that. Fallen nature took the place of that unfallen nature. And since then, Romans 3.23 tells us, because each one of us have chosen to sin, for we all have sinned, and what happens? We have fallen short of that glory, of that character. This wickedness progresses, and instead of uh, seeking to regain that glory, what has fallen man done? They attempt to change God. Instead of changing themselves to, to mirror that glory once again, it's as if, you know, in the beginning God said, let us create man in our images, as if man says, let us create God in our image. 
That's what it says in Romans 1 and verse 23 is this wickedness is progressing. It says that the wicked changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So how do we give this glory to God if it's something that we don't even have? How do we give something to God that we don't ourselves even have? Well, the answer is found back in Revelation 14 and verse 7. As we said last time, we cannot give glory to God until we first fear God. If fearing God is that experience of conversion, then immediately God is doing a work of repair in the heart. Once we turn from that that direction of sin, And we fear God. We give Him that reverential respect. He begins a work in the heart. There is a a repair that God is doing there where He can once again make the human heart, even a fallen human heart, back into something that can give glory to God. Amen? What happened to Moses when he spent time with God? Coming down off that mountain, that same experience we were talking about. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. Was this Moses' own glory shining forth? Whose glory was it? It was God's glory. It was because Moses was in the presence of God that he reflected that glory. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. What did they do? They were so afraid. What did they make Moses do? Put a veil. He had to cover his face. They were afraid to look upon him. You know, in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being what? transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's a work that only He can do. And as you spend time in His presence, you and I will be changed. Amen? We often say it. The things we used to love, now we hate. The things we used to hate, now we love. I mean, there was, I can think back to my pre-conversion experience, and I laughed at Christians. Because I thought to myself, they listened to the most horrid music. You know, and I was in the rock bands, and I was, you know, I just had a totally different concept of what good music was. And I used to mock the way they talked, and just, you know, to me, it was the Ned Flanders kind of thing, where it was just, it was funny. And I could never picture myself, you know, that was elevator music. Those people were from a different planet. I could never picture myself having anything to do with them. Now I look back at that from a totally different perspective. The things I used to hate, now I love. The things I used to love, now I hate. Now this is not a work that I have done. This is a work that is ongoing that God is doing, amen? It's a change of heart that only He can do. And by spending time with Him, the change happens. Steps to Christ, page 52. We may come with all our weaknesses. I love this. You know, because you may not feel even worthy to come to Him. But it says you can come to Him with all your weakness. Some people say, I'm so weak, and they look at it as a bad thing. You know, recognizing your weakness is a good thing. Amen? Come to Him just as you are. We, we may come with all our weakness, our folly, our sinfulness, and fall at His feet in penitence. It is His glory to encircle us in the arms of His love and to bind up our wounds to cleanse us from all impurity. What is His glory? It's to change us. That's the glory to God. How do you give glory to God? It's to allow Him to change you. That's how you give God glory you begin to reflect His very character. John 7 and verse 18, Jesus said, He who speaks from Himself seeks whose glory? His own. But he who seeks the glory of the One who sent Him is true. And no unrighteousness is in Him. Who here wants to be free from unrighteousness? Amen. Seek Him. Seek Him with all your heart. 
Spend time in His Word. Spend time in prayer. And I promise you, friends, there will be changes that will happen in you you never thought were possible. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. Put quite simply, she says, to give glory to God is to reveal His character in our own, and thus make Him known. And in whatever may, or excuse me, and in whatever way we make known the Father or the Son, we glorify God. In whatever way, as we're allowing Him to put that character within us, in whatever way we make known the Father or the Son, we glorify God. Would that include our good works? Yeah. But these aren't our good works. These are works that He's doing through us. Amen? I like how Jesus said it in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine. Well, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So who's doing the shining? Jesus from within. Let your light shine so, so shine before men that they may see your good works and what is the result? And glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jesus said in John 15 in that comparison to the vine, He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in Me and I in Him bears much fruit, for without Me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you what? Bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. How is the Father glorified? When you bear much fruit. So the question begs to be answered. How much surrender does it take to give glory to God? How much surrender does it take? What in your life experience is off limits to surrender? Can you think of a single thing? If this is a work that He must do, if we must fear God and reverence Him and recognize that He is God and we are not, how much surrender will it take for us to give glory to God? It must be all. It has to be all. Messages to young people. To have the religion of Christ means that you have absolutely surrendered your all to God and consented to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit, moral power will be given you. And not only will you have your former entrusted talents for the service of God, but their efficiency will be greatly multiplied. You Remember the parable of the talents? Certain talents are divvied out. The master comes back and he's checking, have the talents grown? Why would they grow? Because as they're surrendered to God, he empowers them and they become greater. She says here, the former entrusted talents for the service of God, they're going to they're gonna grow in their efficiency. I want to center in on a couple ways that maybe we have rationalized and we're preventing the glory of God from fully shining through. Some areas of life, and remember, this is your total life, right? So I could stand up here, I mean, we could preach surrender, for until Jesus comes again because there's so many areas of the life. But here's some, here's some ones that I see. What about our finances? Remember the story of the widow who came and she gave those two mites? Luke 22, 1 through 4. And he looked up, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasure. And he, he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in how much? She put in all the livelihood that she had. All of it. Jesus is saying that she gave more, even though two mites is a very small amount of money. She gave more than those who were rich, who gave great amounts of money. Why? 
because she gave it all. It's all that she had. Do we give glory to God with our giving as we analyze our own personal giving? Do we give glory to God in our giving? Or are we out of our abundance giving back to the Lord? You know, as I say these things, trust me, I'm speaking to myself as well. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, they're very concerned about where the funds are going. When God says give the tithe, does he in any way tell you that you're to determine where that tithe goes? It's to go where? To the storehouse. You read in the book of Malachi, chapter 2, he spends an entire chapter berating the priest because of their abominations. And then in the next chapter, he tells the people, you've robbed me. Why? Because you haven't given to the storehouse. Who got the money from the storehouse? The priests, who he just spent an entire chapter berating because of their abominations. Jesus is giving acclamation to this woman who gave all that she had to the very people that would later be the ones to cry out to crucify him on the cross. I think we need to be less concerned about where God's money is going in the fact that we give what he has commanded. Amen? And we'll let God deal with the rest. I found this in Councils on Stewardship, page 101. The portion that God has reserved for himself, the tithe, is not to be diverted to any other purpose than that which he has specified. Let none feel at liberty to retain their tithe, to use according to their own judgment. They are not to use it for themselves in an emergency, nor to apply it as they see fit, even in what they may regard as the Lord's work. Interesting. Let's go to another angle here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to what? The glory of God. Is this text saying that you could possibly eat or drink in a way that was not to the glory of God? I think it is. I think it's saying that there is lifestyle choices that we could make that would glorify God and there are lifestyle choices we could make that would not bring glory to God. Has there always been a dietary restriction, by the way? Even before sin, there was a dietary restriction, wasn't there? You can eat of all these trees except for this one. Always been a dietary restriction. Do we have special light on diet in these last days as God is preparing a people for His second coming? Yes, we do. In all these, again, I want to go back to the, to the root question does God love you? Yes. If He loves you and you trust Him, then none of the things that I'm presenting here this morning should look or feel like legalism. Amen? We shouldn't be asking the question, what's the lowest rung I can climb to and still get in? That should not be our, our heart question. We're talking about bringing glory to God. So the question rather is, what can I do, Lord, that would bring glory to you? Amen? Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3. She says, I was again shown that the health reform is one branch of the great work which is to fit a people for the coming of the Lord. Is this important, yes or no? It is as closely connected with the third angel's message as the hand is with the body. Everybody take a look at your hand. Is it connected? Is it an intimate part of your everyday experience? She says, as closely connected as the hand is with the body is this health reform. She goes on to say, men and women cannot violate natural law by indulging depraved appetite and lustful passions and not violate the law of God. Therefore, he has permitted the light of health reform to shine upon us that we may see our sin in violating the laws which he has established in our being. In other words, what she's saying is, if I can paraphrase that, to violate the natural law by an indulging depraved appetite, we're actually violating the law of God. And because of that, God in His mercy and love has brought great light to us so that we recognize that. Amen? Did you ever notice how the three angels' messages really kind of find their whole meaning and being in the most holy place? Where was the glory of God? 
It was in the most holy place. Where was the law of God? It was in the most holy place. Where is the health message? Well, when you study that out, it's actually found in the most holy place. It's the manna that was in that most holy place. Everything that's emanating out of the most holy place is the message for the day and hour that we live in. And if Jesus is going to stop interceding at some point, you and I have to have all the light that we can get in order to live in a way that is not violating his law. Amen? And part of that we're being told here is to not indulge and deprave the appetite. Because when we do, she says we're in direct violation of the law of God. Christian temperance and Bible hygiene. Among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, meat eating will eventually be done away. Flesh will cease to form a part of their diet. We should ever keep this end in view and endeavor to work steadily toward it. I cannot think that in the practice of flesh eating, we are in harmony with the light which God has been pleased to give us. Do we glorify God with our diet? It's a personal question. But it's one that every one of us needs to ask. Amen? Do we glorify God with our giving? Do we glorify God with our diet? And you can go right down the line. You can ask God through His Holy Spirit, reveal these things to me. Give me the courage to step out in a way that I can give that glory to you in my decisions. What else does the Bible say? Since I've already ruined your lunch. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. The Bible's clear about how we treat our body as to whether or not that will glorify God. It says flee from sexual immorality. It says a lot, actually, about that. But it goes on to say, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Every aspect, every aspect of our life comes down to the question, How can I glorify you? What level of surrender have I brushed under the carpet and thought maybe that's off limits to God? This morning, I want to gently remind you, nothing is off limits to God. Amen? He has bought you. Paid for in full. Now, you could resist. I could resist. But friends, I don't want to be on the outside of that city someday, do you? I don't want to be there. You know, it talks about when the plagues fall. Very interesting statement since we're studying what it means to give God glory. Revelation 16, speaking on those plagues, it says, And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and what? And give Him glory. They were unwilling to give God glory, and they will be unwilling even as the plagues fall. To give him glory. I think it's interesting in the Bible that God's people are likened unto the bride, the bride of Christ. And you know, we're told the bride makes herself ready, right? There's preparations in order for that that marriage to be complete. And in that preparation, these people, God's bride, are allowing him to remove every spot and every blemish. Amen? Revelation 19, John sees in vision this bride and he says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him what? Glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. What is that fine linen, clean and bright? It's the robe of Christ's righteousness. And then it says it this way, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now you could misread that and you could say, well, that's their own acts. But if it's Christ's righteous robe, then whose acts is it really? It's his acts. It's his acts being lived out in his people, making her ready for the marriage. He must have a fitting bride. And that bride, we're told in Scripture, is without spot and without blemish. It's interesting, too, that in Revelation, it also likens the bride to the great city, to the new Jerusalem. It's the imagery that Revelation uses. Revelation 21, verses 10 and 11, 
And he carried me away in the spirit to the great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. God's people are likened unto the bride. God's people are likened unto the city. Both have the glory. You know, when they built that temple you read about in the Old Testament, they would, they would take those stones and they would chisel and they would shape them. And you ever read that as they were building Solomon's temple? Do you ever notice that they did none of that at the temple itself, right? All the shaping, all the chiseling, all that happened away and they would bring it in and silently, as to not even make a noise, as quietly as possible, be putting those blocks into place. I like the imagery in Revelation of you and I being part of that city. The jewels, the doors, the gates, the foundation, all of that is God's people. And where is the shaping, where is the chiseling taking place? taking place right now, right here. And when he's done, when it's complete, when you're that, that perfect shape that he wants to put into that city wall, then you will be placed there. And when John sees that city in, in imagery there, he says that it has the glory of God, perfectly reflecting his workmanship. This imperative, just the second imperative to give glory to God, again, flies in the face of the agenda of the beast. You remember as we studied Revelation chapter 13, they are making something in the image of something as well, aren't they? And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs by which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So while the wicked are forming an image or a likeness to the beast. God's people are forming an image or a likeness to who? To God. The warning that tells us to fear God and give glory to Him, we are forming an image, a likeness to our loving King. 1 John, in closing, chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. The Bible says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be what? Like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. Now what I've shared with you this morning is not new truth, but it is present truth. Something I believe the devil would love for you to forget, and it's for this reason that I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. 